Well, good morning. Here we are again another week using our video worship service. And I know some of you are, are not able to come and attend at, here at Park Avenue. And we completely understand. Uh, the circumstances in which we're living right now make it difficult for some to uh, maintain safety and maintain their health. And we understand it, but we want you to completely understand that we really miss you. Um, and that we can't wait for the day that when we all come back together, I would encourage you to maintain your courage and maintain your hope. Um, I know things right now seem bleak, but they're not. Things will be okay in due time and things will uh, maybe get back to a, no a normal that we can recognize and feel comfortable in. But until that time happens, keep tuning in and we will keep providing these video worship services and the weekly journey with Christ with Steve and I. And just stay positive. Stay positive. It's going to be okay and everything's going to eventually come to a place where we're, we're okay with it. So enjoy some of the worship music and then I'll be speaking to you uh, on our weekly service. Thanks. Does Jesus care when my heart I know. 
Well, good morning, church. I hope everyone has uh, survived this past week with all the circumstances. I didn't know it could get quite this hot this, er this early in July. Uh, I've been working on my, my daughter's buying a house. So I've been working on that house and helping do things on it. And I'm not kidding you, it is just hot beyond hot. And I'm not a spring chicken anymore. So this has been kind of difficult on me. I hope you are staying positive. I hope you are being reassured in your life that God is with you. You know, sometimes we forget about that. We begin to look at... Everything that's going on around us, much like Peter when he was got out of the boat and stepped out onto the water. At first he had his eyes on Jesus, and then he began to look at the waves. And the waves, as he looked at them, he began to sink. You and I can have the same reaction if we constantly look at the circumstances that are going on around us. You need to keep your eyes focused on, on Jesus because he's with you. The Holy Spirit is with you, and they're, they're here to assist us as we walk on this journey. Remember when he told the disciples he would not leave them as orphans? He's not leaving anyone, alone. He's not leaving anyone behind. So stay, stay positive, stay encouraged, but most importantly right now, keep your eyes and hearts focused on Jesus. Last week we talked about freedom, and being as it was the 4th of July weekend, I thought it was only appropriate that we speak about the concept of freedom, and specifically what comes with freedom. People automatically think once you have the freedom to choose, you there's nothing else left to do but just be free, but it, that's not true. Freedom comes with various uh, costs or uh, requirements. Remember, freedom will bring consequences because if you overextend your freedom, you will find out. With freedom comes responsibility. And freedom reveals the integrity that is in you because if you're able to do whatever you want, given the opportunity, if you hurt someone, that reveals your integrity. This week, we're going to talk about our personal struggles with freedom. Uh, I mean, our story, our Bible begins with the story of Adam and Eve and their problem they had with freedom because they chose poorly. And I see that in our, our lives, our struggle with freedom comes with the same kind of choice as what we decide to do and not to do. And we're always in a constant battle with our wants. Should I do this? Do I do that? Or what do I want? That is a very important question. What do you want? I mean, really, what do you want? There have been many times in my life where I thought I wanted something, but I didn't really want. How many of you have made a decision thinking I wanted that and then got stuck with the responsibility that come from that choice coming to find out you didn't really want it? I think we could all list many things that, that would fall into that category. Our problem is there's a fundamental problem. It seems most of the time what we want isn't really what we want. Now, this is for my wife. Garth Brooks sung a song a few years back. She doesn't like Garth Brooks. But the song was titled, Thanking God for Unanswered Prayers. How many of you could say that? That that one person you thought you really loved and you were dating, he said, oh God, please let me have him or her. And then as time went by, you broke up and you think to yourself, oh, God, thank you for not giving me him or her. Or how many have made choices that didn't go the way they wanted? They thought they wanted those things. 
Have you ever bought something later to wish you hadn't? In fact, now we have laws that says um, that if you in a few days decide that you made a bad choice, you can return it. It seems that we've become quite good at wanting things and then later finding out, well, we didn't really want them. I always told somebody, you know, how long does a new car last to be a new car until you get the first payment? That's when you realize, ah, oh, I'm burdened. I'm, why did I want that car? Why did I want that house? Why did I want that whatever it may be, all of a sudden your wants come with cost. Do you know someone who wanted something so bad and get it and later wish they'd never purchased it or did it? Now this might, I want to take into context of things that we've wanted that we didn't necessarily purchase, but maybe more specifically, we thought we wanted that party to be out that night drinking and having, I need this, I want this. And then later that decision didn't go well. I'm sure a lot of times people start off using drugs in the same thing they want to feel different. And then with it comes some other consequences they didn't really think about. Love affairs, with married folks begin in the same way. They think they want those things and then in the middle of it, they realize, oh, I've made a huge mistake. Or people who gamble looking for fulfillment in some other aspect of their life and then they realize, oh, my, I wanted to gamble then now, but now I have nothing. We all know someone or maybe we also have wanted those things and then wished we would have never even thought about it. But the problem is we chose, didn't we? Picked, we, we wanted, and we wanted it. Paul asked the question, why do I want what I want? What's, what's wrong with me? I mean, much like Garth Brooks songs, I thank God for unanswered prayers because I thought I wanted this, but I didn't. So many of our wants were things that we realized we didn't want after it was too late. In Jeremiah 17, verse 9, it reads, The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? Jeremiah nailed it on the head. Who can understand why we want what we want? There's got to be a reason for this, wouldn't you think? That would, why we would be so motivated sometimes for something that the minute we get it, it doesn't fulfill the thing we thought it would. Not only did I want something with my heart, but my mind told me it was okay. You ever have that happen? This is maybe where the expression, what was I, what was I thinking, is most appropriate. Doctors and counselors have now found that our minds produce rational answers from which we can use to explain or justify our decisions. Have you noticed how the minute you decide your heart wants something and you decide, oh, I'm going to get it, your mind starts computing all these various things like, oh, yeah, here's the reason why you want that. It starts giving you the data to support the decision you've just made with your heart because you wanted it. And then we use that same information to justify to other people. To the point, though, that once it's all over with and we have it, that's when we come back to this question, why did I, what was I doing? What was I thinking? What is wrong with me? And it's not only like we, des we struggle with our desires, you know, as far as the fleshly part, but it seems like there's something in our heart that just wants something. There are several things that come into play in this want. First of all, 
We want it our way. Have you, have you noticed how everything now is uh, specifically oriented towards yourself? I can remember the time, of course, I don't drink coffee, but I can remember the time where you got it with cream and with sugar or with, without. Now, go order a coffee. I mean, you really got to have, know what you're doing when you go to order coffee because you may make a mess out of it. I'm, just, well, I'm glad I don't drink coffee. But there are so many things. Burger King did ads for years. You want it your way? We're going to do it for you. <laughs> uh, that's where we are. We want things our way. We want life our way, don't we? We want it everything now. Life happens the way we think it should happen. And when it doesn't, what kind of people are we? I mean, I'm driving down the road. People don't drive the way I think they ought to. Trust me. I'm not a pleasant person sometimes. Ultimately, though, what I thought I wanted wasn't what I really wanted at all. And that is often the, the biggest truth of this entire sermon. How often do we want some form of pleasure? We want um, maybe we just want to sit back and watch TV. Have, have you known someone who watches so much TV that they just don't do anything? What about the person who just wants to uh, binge on, on their computer, on social media, on video games, maybe sports. How about golf? I've got friends that all they do is play golf. How about the following the professional teams? I mean, it seems like now we have an entire industry that all it does is everybody spends time watching a screen or going to the game, and it's all we do. It is our pleasure. We say to ourselves, I need this, I, you know. But in truth, it's what we want, and we keep wanting more of it to the point that what we want ends up not being what we really want. Shopping can come in the same way, too. There are people who constantly buy clothes just to have them hang in the closet and then just left there. But it felt good buying them. They wanted to have them. And there are people in financial ruin related to that concept. We want it all now, too. We're no longer willing to wait for anything. We've become so impatient. I shared this with you a few weeks ago about the fact that most videos, if they won't load in just a few seconds, people will start to leave the site. And even if waiting could be our greatest ally, think about it. How many times if we just had a few moments to wait, would we have changed our mind? That want would have worked, but no, not now. Society now has made it possible for us to get everything we want and we win when we want it, which is now. Our wants, like freedom, reveal we have consequences, responsibility, and they show our character. One of the things that comes out of this want thing that is prevalent in everyone who deals with it is regret. The minute you realize that you didn't really want it, you deal with that dreaded word of regret. You regret that you bought it, did it, went there, wanted it, participated in it, whatever it may be, and you constantly live with this regret of the choices and, and the decisions you make based on things that you want. It seems what we want isn't what we really want. Really want is what we need. You know, we want love in our lives, but we, then we think sex is the answer. We want peace in our lives, and then we look for 
some political faction to satisfy to make us feel at peace or we look, want to live in neighborhoods where there's, it's peaceful. We want, we want the world that we live in, we want, it, we want it to be peaceful and we do whatever we can to get peace. But I don't think they can provide the peace that you're looking for. We want joy in our life, so we do anything that will make us happy thinking they're one and the same, but they're not. We drink, get drunk, do whatever just to feel happy, and it has the complete and total opposite effect as a boomerang effect that later on you don't feel happy. In fact, you feel bad for what you've done. What we really want is never in what we want. I'm going to say that again so you can hear it. What we really want is never in what we want. Most forms of sin are trying to fill a void we have in our lives. A person who deals with gambling problems, is that may be the sin, but that's not what's behind the sin. Sexual uh, Promiscuity is not, that's the sin, but that's not what motivates the sin. The shopping might end up being a sin, but that's not what motivates the sin. The want that's behind it is the problem. It always has been, but we've sort of missed it. You know, James in James chapter 4 says something that that's very important for us to understand and, and listen to because... These are powerful verses. James chapter 4, verse 1. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask God, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. If I would have asked you, why don't you pray to God about, <coughs> excuse me, about what you want? Well, your first reaction is, he's not going to give me what I want. Much like any parent knows when their child comes up to them and says, can I have a thousand dollars? Can I have a brand new car? Can I have uh, this, that, or whatever it may be? For a long time, we told them, no, um, no, wait. In the same way, we know God would do it. Well, but why does God say no to us? Is it because that's not what we really want? Did you hear that verse 3? When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives. See, we always read that as I was asking with a bad attitude. That's not the context. Really what it should read is because you ask with bad motives, meaning you're asking for the wrong reasons. You think these things that you're asking for will, fit, will help you in your life. I, I want you to imagine you're a parent and your child comes up first times, asks, for a new car. He says, I want a new car. And you say, no, you don't need a new car. Your car is fine. If they kept at coming up and asking you these various questions for various things, you would begin to think, okay, there's something going on here. I need to check out, find out about it. You inquire of your child, and you come to find out that they're friends with someone who has all this stuff and they feel like they're inferior to everyone around them. You would sit down with your child and explain to them that what, they're, what you're offering your child is not stuff. You want time with your child. You want, you want the good things for your life. Explain to them about how getting everything you want is not necessarily a good thing you would immediately get to the root of their problem. We grasp that as parents, as we do with our child. I wish we grasped it, grasped it as much as we do in our relationship with our father. 
because we keep asking for, we keep wanting things that are going to not help us a bit. You know, a better job might put more money in your pocket, but it also might take you from your family more than you could ever begin to think about. Tell me, in the end, which one will make the biggest difference? The more money or the less time with the child or the wife? You know which one's going to be better in the long run. But why is it that we chase after those wants? Because we think that in the end, we rationalize to ourselves, they're going to make a difference. But they don't. We look around at the world we live in, and everyone is wanting something to deal with what they really want or they really need. And we, right now, as a society, are so caught up in materialism and self-indulgence. We won't say no to ourselves for any, to anything. The answer seems to be now, yes. To everything you want. I shared with you and I'll share it again because it's going to come up in this lesson. C.S. Lewis describes hell and hell is actually living in a world where you get everything you want. Now he goes into a lot more detail which I'm going to in a later lesson. But here's the thing. After people begin to get what they want, have you ever been around the child who got everything they want when they were growing up? How much time did you like spending with that particular child? I've been around one or two. It's not pleasant. They become arrogant. They become prideful. They become demanding. You've seen the child that throws the temper tantrums because they're not getting what they want because they know that it will work. Can you imagine living in a world like that? It's happening right before our very eyes. See, the truth is, what we really want cannot be purchased or acquired with money, power, or pressure. What we really want is something of value, personal values, like the character that's in us, the integrity, the honesty, the loving, the peace, those attributes that we desperately want to be instilled in us and to grow up as Jesus or Paul talked about in Galatians about the fruits of the Spirit, those attributes are what we really, really want. But see, you've got to come to the conclusion on your own of is this what you really want? We need to find what we value what you value. Because some, you're valuing something that's what you're lacking and what you want, which is causing you to want these things that don't have anything to do with what you value. In Jeremiah chapter 17, where I read earlier about the deceitful heart, I want to read the verses prior and before it to give you even a deeper context about what Jeremiah is talking about. Jeremiah 17, verse 7. But blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in Him. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind to reward each person according to their conduct, according to what their deeds deserve. Oftentimes what happens in our lives is those wants that we want come with a high price, the consequences the responsibility, and they reveal the character behind the want. Much like verse 10 of Jeremiah 17 says, I search the heart and examine the mind to reward each person according to their conduct. 
your decisions of of wanting the wrong things will continue until you figure out what it is you really, really want. The value, what you're looking for deep down inside. Now, it's not the same for everybody. They're going to be, the list may be similar, but there's going to be people that's going to have different things at the top of their list. And there's not a right one that should be at the top I'm not talking about, do you love Jesus? That Those concepts are understood. What I'm talking about is what you want to see in, your, in you, the person who walks every day before God. That's what's really what you value. In the coming weeks, we will continue our discussion on freedom and what it means and the choices that come with it and the responsibilities that come. And we will talk more about what do we want. I pray that in the coming weeks and days that you will be encouraged and you will grow stronger in your faith toward Jesus Christ that the things that we're doing will assist you and I encourage you every day to get on your knees and pray to God to help you find what you really, really want. God bless and have a great day. I keep fighting voices in my mind that say I'm not enough.